Hello everyone, my name is Robius, and today I bring you the 14th episode in the renewed iteration of Assassin's Creed The Real History. As has been the theme for the last few videos, I'll be continuing my sub-series in which I chronologically explore the time periods chosen as the backdrops for the various Assassin's Creed titles, giving you a review of their major historical events, discussing any gaps in the history left by the games, and introducing you to the individuals who actually existed. Having said that, as the video title indicates, today's episode will be centered on the Golden Age of Piracy, which represented the set piece for Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag. For that reason, please be aware of story spoilers throughout the entire video. In addition, just before I begin, I want to point out that the order of these videos is based on their chronological occurrence in history as opposed to the order in which they were actually released as games. With that in mind, I'd like to start by quickly establishing the scope of this topic. It's important to recognize that the Golden Age of Piracy didn't come into existence as a term until over a century after the period concluded, and consequently, historians often disagree when defining its span in time. For the sake of this video, I'm personally going to go with one of the more liberal interpretations that stretches from the 1650s up until the 1720s, but please understand that various sources usually define the parameters of the period differently. Nevertheless, within this scope, the Golden Age was fundamentally a historic interval in which there were three major eruptions of piracy that became impossible for one nation or another to overlook. Therefore, as we discuss the history of the Golden Age of piracy prior to the events of Assassin's Creed IV, we'll begin with the first of these three occurrences, often referred to as the Buccaneering Period. In the late 1640s, Western nations began to invest further in their colonies, and consequently resumed the aggressive competition for control of the Caribbean. The catalyst for this outburst of piracy is thought to have been the Spanish attempts to eliminate the French presence in Española. The French settlers who fled quickly made their way to Tortuga, which they successfully fortified and defended with the help of supplementary Dutch and English colonists who sought to oppose the Spanish. These individuals came to be known as the Buccaneers, an early sect of non-traditional pirates recognized for their large, militarized crews and their brutally efficient tactics. Beginning by raiding Spanish shipments, the Buccaneers quickly received the indirect sponsorship of both the British and French governments, whose underlying goal was to weaken Spain's regional influence. With this support, the Buccaneers moved from solely pillaging ships to actively targeting Spanish ports and settlements for large-scale attacks. Among those who gained infamy in this period stood Lawrence Prinz, a Dutch buccaneer perhaps best remembered for the raid he led on Granada and his participation in the sack of Panama while serving under the legendary Captain Henry Morgan. However, by the late 1680s, with Spain's grip on the Caribbean weakened, the buccaneers became a liability for the French and British. They subsequently cracked down on their crimes, ceased to support them, and fundamentally succeeded in making the prospect of remaining a buccaneer more of a risk than it was worth, thus leading many to change course and either seek legal employment or simply leave the region altogether and join more nomadic pirate crews. Jean-Baptiste Ducasse, who did not appear in the game but did serve as the inspiration for his fictional nephew in Black Flag, is considered by some sources to have been among the last of the buccaneers who eventually abandoned that life in pursuit of a military career instead. Although small-scale piracy continued to exist in the region for years, it was marginal in comparison to what was experienced in the time of the buccaneers. In fact, it wasn't until the early 1690s that the next outburst of piracy is thought to have started. This period is most commonly called the Pirate Round, and began when the lack of thriving economic trade in the region, and a general shortfall in available privateering contracts led most pirates to seek wealth outside of the Caribbean. In an attempt to find new, lucrative targets, select individuals pioneered the sailing route which would come to be known as the Pirate Round. This route paralleled the path of the East India Company to some extent leading the pirates to Madagascar from where they would begin to launch their raids along the African coast all the way to India. It is thought that the massive success of certain early voyages on the pirate round quickly inspired many others to follow suit, with those repeating the expeditions earning themselves the nickname of Roundsmen. Although this second outburst of piracy lasted less than a decade, in its earliest years it proved to be very profitable, with pirates easily plundering the poorly defended and yet often valuable shipments traversing through the Indian Ocean. Ultimately, the pirate round came to an end due to the British response of better defending their shipments, with whatever participants were left eventually getting swept up in the War of Spanish Succession, in which countless opportunities for legal employment as privateers suddenly arose. 
Once again, piracy returned to its decline until the War of Spanish Succession ended around a decade later. By 1715, a series of treaties had been signed between the combating nations. Now entering a period of relative peace, Britain sought to lessen the financial burden it had acquired by building a massive naval military apparatus. To that end, the English Navy disbanded the service of countless sailors and terminated a large portion of its privateering contracts. In consequence, a massive amount of well-trained, combat-ready sailors were left without a purpose, with a large percent among these turning to illegal practices to survive. When understanding that this post-war period represented another interval of heavy investment in cross-Atlantic trade, primarily through the concept of the triangular transatlantic slave trade, it is clear why so many of these men became pirates, seeking to utilize their skill sets to acquire quick wealth while establishing themselves a life beyond the restrictions of law. It was at this point, historically, that Assassin's Creed IV officially began introducing us to the fictional privateer-turned-pirate Edward Kenway during the early stages of this third and final outbreak of piracy, generally referred to as the post-Spanish succession period. Although the entire opening portion of the game was fictionalized, it did lead to an important historical event. As part of the invented narrative, Edward unknowingly killed a defector from the assassin order and then attempted to impersonate him in hopes of making a profit once he realized that the man was set to meet with Laureano de Torres y Ayala, the governor of Cuba. For that reason, he traveled to Havana and met with Torres, who was revealed to the oblivious Edward as being the Grand Master of the Templar Order. Here, he learned about the Templar's hunt for the sage an individual with a mystical background who was capable of locating an invaluable temple called the Observatory. Eventually, however, Edward's ruse was discovered by the Templars, leading them to imprison him aboard the Spanish treasure fleet heading to Sevilla, where he would be sentenced for his crimes. Once on the vessel, Edward met another captive named Adewale, and together they planned their escape. Now, as I stated, although this entire early portion was fictional, it led to the following real-world event. Just as Edward and Adewale began freeing fellow captives and commandeered a vessel as part of their escape, a nearby storm quickly developed into a hurricane. As part of the game's fictional spin on history, the small band of pirates barely avoided disaster while the remainder of the Spanish treasure fleet was sunk by the hurricane. Historically speaking, certain sources state that one of the 12 ships in the fleet did avoid being destroyed, however there are no records indicating that it had been commandeered by pirates. Nevertheless, the sinking of the so-called 1715 Spanish treasure fleet by a hurricane created a rather unique opportunity for some of the pirates of the period. Spanish authorities quickly recognized the loss of their valuable fleet and made attempts to salvage what treasures they could, all while making an active effort to hide this operation from outsiders. Unfortunately for them, a group of pirates soon discovered the location of one salvage operation near Florida and organized an attack. Arriving with a superior force, the pirates, who were led in part by Benjamin Hornigold and Charles Vane, forced the Spanish to turn over everything they had salvaged. Despite this success, the pirates were presented with a surprise when the governor of Jamaica barred them from using his ports to unload these stolen goods. This series of events led to the serendipitous decision to found their own base of operations in the generally abandoned area of Nassau. Using the funds gathered from their successful raid, this group of individuals laid the foundation for their future pirate republic. Although sources argue on its early leadership structure, most agree that the polarizing pirates Benjamin Hornigold and Henry Jennings represented its initial de facto administrators, with both men mentoring a series of pirates who would eventually reach infamy in their own right. Overall, the pirates operating out of this new republic were recognized by authorities as the Flying Gang. Nevertheless, in the game, Edward then traveled to Nassau and regrouped with his allies, among which was Hornigold's protege at the time, Edward Thatch, who would eventually come to be known as the legendary Blackbeard. Thereafter, a series of fictional missions occurred in which the pirates further established their republic, while Edward became elsewhere acquainted with the Assassin Order. At this point, the game had a brief return to history by having Charles Vane reach Nassau in 1717. This is indicative of one historical interpretation which has Vane joining the Republic at this later date, whereas certain other accounts list him as one of its founders following their raid of the Spanish treasure. Either way, the game depicts Vane now as the captain of his own vessel and accompanied by his quartermaster, Jack Rackham. Notably, this may have been a minor anachronism since the earliest records of Rackham joining Vane's crew were in 1718. 
Either way, what followed was a fictional domino effect in the story, whereby Vane tipped Edward off to Governor Torres' location, leading him to capture the Templar leader and use him to locate the Sage. This plan ultimately fell apart, with both the Sage and Torres getting away. However, it led to another interesting historical tidbit. During this hunt for the mystical sage, Edward's ally, who he'd only known as James Kidd, revealed that she was actually a woman disguised as a man and was named Mary Reed. Although this revelation was depicted as occurring a few years earlier than it was historically recorded, Mary Reed was in fact one of the few infamous female pirates of the period who spent most of her early career dressing as a man. Regardless, the game continued to parallel history by having word spread in 1718 that Woods Rogers, the new British governor of the Bahamas, was on his way to Nassau with the intention of offering the king's pardon to all pirates. At this point, Black Flag gave players a wonderful look at the internal turmoil this caused, with some considering the proposal while others outright opposed the idea. According to the game's story, the Pirate Republic was soon faced with a need for medicine. Kenway proceeded to coordinate with Blackbeard to solve this problem by searching the wreckage of the Spanish treasure fleet, but to no avail. In this time, he also became aware of a partnership between Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet, an old acquaintance who'd recently come under the tutelage of the more experienced pirate. Now, although this mission for medicine was technically fictionalized, Blackbeard is thought to have visited the area around that point in history. Nonetheless, in the game, this failure led Blackbeard to establish a blockade of Charlestown's port. During this venture, he captured a series of vessels, stole their cargo, and took certain valuable hostages, which included Samuel Ragg, a representative from the Council of the Province of Carolina. With these hostages in hand, Blackbeard moved his fleet within eyesight of the town, and using Ragg as his intermediary, he organized a deal that would see the captives released in exchange for medicine. Although Blackbeard's envoys were dispatched to Charlestown, after almost a week, he still hadn't received the medicine. This was the point in the game where Kenway met back up with Blackbeard and offered to resolve the problem, going ashore and retrieving the medicine himself. In reality, this evidently did not occur, and instead the pirate fleet was moved into the harbor and they finally received the medicine as it was revealed that the delays were caused by Blackbeard's dispatched crew members getting drunk and not completing their task. In the end, the hostages were released and the pirates left with their prize. At the conclusion of this event, the game again followed history by having Blackbeard indicate to Kenway his intention of leaving the Pirate Republic behind and perhaps accepting the royal pardon. For that reason, the men parted ways, as Thatch and his second-in-command Israel Hands sailed north while the fictional Edward Kenway returned to Nassau. Upon reaching the Pirate Republic, Edward got a glimpse at the early stages of the developing relationship between Jack Rackham and his future partner Anne Bonny who would later join Mary Reed as being remembered among the few female pirates to reach infamy in the period. However, this historical tidbit was quickly followed up with an incredibly important event in July of 1718. Without much warning, Nassau's port was suddenly blockaded by the Royal Navy. The three vessels had been dispatched by Woods Rogers, and under the command of Commodore Peter Chamberlain, they prevented any pirates from leaving. Rogers had finally arrived to give the pirates their ultimatum in terms of deciding whether or not they would accept the pardon. Once again, the game correctly depicted the schism between those who followed Benjamin Hornigold and accepted the clemency, like Josiah Burgess and John Cockrum, and those who refused to abandon the life and instead followed Charles Vane. In Black Flag, Kenway sided with Vane, and together they plotted their escape. According to the game, Edward killed Commodore Chamberlain, and with Vane's help, launched a fire ship towards the British vessels, destroying them and making an opening for them to escape. In reality, there is no record of the Commodore being killed, and the fire ship they used did not strike any British vessels, although it did force them to move and gave Vane the necessary space to successfully flee from Nassau. Historically thereafter, Vane traveled to meet with Blackbeard in hopes of convincing him to join forces and potentially take Nassau back. Although his exact reasons for doing so are debated, Blackbeard declined the offer. The game claims this decision was due to Thatch's desire to remain retired. Furthermore, it accelerated the timeline by then having Lieutenant Robert Maynard's forces discover their location just as Vane was leaving. What followed in terms of the historical record was a full-out confrontation between Blackbeard's men and Maynard's British troops. Despite the game's clear exaggeration in terms of scaling the British attack to be a lot larger than it actually was, in reality, the two forces clashed, and as the pirates gained the upper hand, Blackbeard led a charge to board Maynard's vessel, only to be surprised by the additional British troops who'd been hiding in the hold. 
at that point, Black Flag relatively followed some of the contrasting reports concerning the battle's conclusion, in which Blackbeard was eventually overwhelmed and killed, while adding in their fictional twist of having Edward thrown off the ship immediately following his friend's demise. Continuing onward with the invented narrative, the game then had Edward regroup with Vane in an attempt to once again try and locate the sage. This fabricated, unsuccessful venture led to another historical occurrence, although the game presented its surrounding circumstances differently than they were recorded. Historically speaking, after Vane ordered a retreat when attacking a French warship he felt incapable of taking, his crew under Jack Rackham turned against him. They led a mutiny, installing Rackham as the new captain while marooning Vane and a few of his loyalists. The game differed in this sense by having the mutiny occur while they were hunting for the sage and by having Vane solely marooned with Edward Kenway. The pair eventually reached an isolated island where they remained stranded for an undisclosed amount of time. Vane progressively lost his sanity, leading to a confrontation between the pirates in which Edward severely beat Vane and abandoned him on the island as he escaped on a passing merchant vessel. In reality, Charles did remain trapped on such an island for an unknown period of time until a series of events led him to be arrested after he was recognized as a pirate while trying to secure safe passage on a vessel. Finally reuniting with his crew, who'd recovered his ship from Rackham after the man returned to Nassau and accepted the king's pardon, as he did historically, Captain Kenway resumed his search for the sage. During his fictitious attempts to gather intelligence, Edward came across his former mentor Benjamin Hornigold, now a pirate hunter and, according to the game, a member of the Templar Order. After a brief battle, Edward raced to reach Principe, where he had heard the Templars were planning on ambushing the sage. Upon arriving in Principe, Edward came across the failed result of the pirate captain Howell Davis's attempt to take the Portuguese governor hostage. Although they had originally fooled their targets into thinking they were British representatives, the pirates had been discovered before they could take the governor captive and Davis's landing party was killed. While evaluating the scene, Edward was ambushed by the sage. Now, although he'd been introduced many times in the story already, this would represent the first accurate historical appearance of Bartholomew Roberts, who in the game was presented as being the mystical sage capable of finding the observatory. In reality, Roberts had until recently served aboard the slave ship named the Princess, but just weeks earlier had joined the pirate crew that attacked his vessel. Unfortunately, this new partnership was short-lived following their failed operation in Principe, which the game attributed to the interference of the now Templars Burgess and Cockrum. As Roberts spoke with Kenway, an agreement was made whereby they would partner up on the condition that Edward free the remainder of Bartholomew's crewmates and killed the Templars responsible for the ambush. Although Edward's participation was fictionalized, Roberts did actually lead a later attack on Principe to avenge the death of their former captain. Returning from his task, Edward walked in at the moment where Davis's crew elected Roberts as their new captain, thus signaling the start of a career which would eventually have him listed as perhaps the single most successful pirate of the entire period. In the game, Roberts then requested Edward's assistance off the coast of Brazil before bringing him to the observatory. This had our protagonist participating in one of Bartholomew's most daring historic raids. Intent on stealing Portuguese riches, Roberts approached one of their anchored fleets which numbered 42 vessels. Capturing one of the smallest ships, he took its captain hostage and used him to identify the most valuable target in the fleet. Sources differ on his methods, but Roberts succeeded in approaching his target without being detected and proceeded to board and overtake the significantly larger and better armed ship, ultimately escaping with his prize. In reality, this heist concluded with Roberts not only acquiring a new flagship, but also discovering that he had stolen some of the treasure which was en route to the King of Portugal. Within the Assassin's Creed narrative, he pulled this off with Edward's help by sporting a Portuguese flag on his ship, and on top of the riches, he also discovered the blood vials the Templars had been gathering to use in the observatory. Soon after, Edward was hunted down by his former mentor Benjamin Hornigold, leading to a battle which concluded with the student killing his teacher. This face-off was entirely invented, but was the game's way of explaining Hornigold's somewhat vague death in 1719, which some attribute to his ship being wrecked in a hurricane. Nevertheless, after all of his efforts, Roberts finally led Kenway to the fictional observatory. There, among other things, they were able to see the moment where Mary Reed reveals herself to be a woman when speaking with Jack Rackham, a circumstance that eventually leads her to openly serve alongside Anne Bonny as a female member of Rackham's crew. 
Unfortunately for Edward, he was immediately thereafter betrayed by Roberts, who subsequently handed him over to the British authorities. This led Kenway to be held captive for months. For that reason, he was present for the mostly historically accurate trial of Anne Bonney and Mary Reed, who'd been arrested while serving under Rackham. After being found guilty and sentenced to hanging, both women revealed that they were pregnant, which provided them with a stay of execution until the birth of their children. In the game, following the trial, Edward was kept captive for four more months until the assassins helped orchestrate his escape. This fictional prison break extended to a scene where he helped a pregnant Anne flee, but was unable to save Mary, who had become severely ill and died in prison after giving birth. During the same escape, Edward found the body of Rackham, who'd already been executed, while also locating a mentally unstable vein who awaited his own execution. After nearly drinking himself to death, Edward finally regrouped with the assassins and, seeking to correct his mistakes, he set out to stop his enemies. His first target was Woods Rogers, whom he tried to kill before his March of 1721 return to Britain. Although Edward unknowingly only wounded Rogers and actually failed to kill him, from the man he ascertained the location of his next target, Bartholomew Roberts. The game had Edward's attack on Rogers coincide with a time frame in which he had been historically wounded in a duel before recovering and returning to Britain. Sailing to the coast of Africa, Edward was able to track down Roberts in early 1722. He gave chase, and eventually the combating pirate vessels were joined by ships from the Royal Navy who had also been in pursuit of Roberts. Eventually boarding his vessel, Edward was able to kill Roberts, and, as per his dying request, he sunk his body so that it may not be used by the Templars. Historically, there were no pirates chasing Roberts. In reality, while attempting to bypass the pursuing British ship and escape, Roberts was hit and killed by a grape shot. Ultimately though, his crew did bury his body at sea in accordance with his wishes. In the game's final sequence, Edward led a fictional hunt for the Templar Grand Master, at first killing a look-alike and then his bodyguard, but ultimately tracking Torres down to the observatory where he assassinated this final rival and sealed off the precursor site once and for all. Following the end of Edward's adventures in the Caribbean, we now proceed to the next chapter in the video to briefly discuss the remaining history of the Golden Age of Piracy which followed the events of Assassin's Creed IV. The game ended in late 1722 at which point the Golden Age was truly on its last leg. Having lost their invaluable base of operations in Nassau years earlier, the pirates of the region never quite re-established themselves elsewhere. Overall, the very behavior which had gained them their riches is what led to their rapid decline. In these later years, the abundance of pirate attacks on European naval trafficking vessels could no longer be ignored. This coincided with a period of European military and naval consolidation, thus leading these nations to recruit heavily once again and eventually deploy a larger number of ships to the Caribbean with the specific goal of dealing with pirates. In addition to this, following the offer of the king's pardon back in 1718, the majority of European governments took a strong legal stand against pirates and anyone who surrendered to them or joined them, thus even further increasing the odds of that lifestyle. All of these components together contributed to the ending of the golden age of piracy. Depending on your sources, it may have concluded at various points in the 1720s, with most agreeing it did not live on to the 1730s. Although pirates continued to exist beyond that point, they never again attained the overwhelming influence they had achieved during their golden age. With that said, we've reached the final chapter in this video, the purpose of which is to review everything we've learned so far while comparing its depiction in the game to the actual history. Prior to starting this analysis, I'd like to quickly reiterate that for the sake of this review I will be mainly concentrating on the major story elements tied to historical events, while omitting minor details related to specific characters. Those will instead be covered within the individual characters' videos at a later date. At this point, I'd like to begin by reviewing the completely fictionalized components of the game. The first of these was clearly the non-existing battle between the Assassins and the Templars over securing the support of the Sage in their bid for control of the precursor site known as the Observatory. Evidently, although it was the main driving force for the game's story, it was completely fictional. The next invented sequence saw the pirates invade a Spanish fort housing the governor of Cuba, whom they proceeded to take hostage. Finally, the last wholly fictionalized portion of the story was its ending confrontation between Edwards and Torres at the Observatory. Having cleared up those entirely fictional components, we can move on to the portion of the game where Ubisoft excels, which is where they take inspiration from real historical events, but utilize certain omissions to mix in their Assassin's Creed lore. 
In terms of the story's major elements, the first such instance was when they took the report of certain sources, indicating a single ship may have survived the hurricane that wrecked the 1715 Spanish treasure fleet and presented it as the doing of their fictional protagonist. Next was their use of a vague time frame in which Edward returned to Nassau following the sinking of the treasure fleet to already find their growing pirate republic in its early stages of development. Although this isn't necessarily wrong, by keeping the timeline a bit vague, it allowed them to better fit it all together within the game's story. Following this, a subsequent manipulation occurred during the blockade of Charlestown. In the game, the situation was solely resolved due to the interference of Edward, who went ashore to secure the medicine, when in reality, they were finally provided to Blackbeard after he pushed his forces into the harbour and finally had his men return to him with their prize. Afterwards, the next alteration took place during the pirates' escape from Nassau, which the game exaggerated by having them kill the British Commodore and destroy his vessels with their fireship, instead of simply displacing them enough to permit a successful departure. The preceding historical manipulation was when Edward met with Bartholomew Roberts and was integral in helping him become captain of his vessel and achieve his revenge on the Portuguese for their attack on his crew. And perhaps the final, major story-oriented historical change made by the writers was the assassin-led prison break in Jamaica, which allowed Edward to escape with Anne Bonny, whose actual fate following her imprisonment remains unknown. With all of these facts in mind, we can now take a moment and consider whether the Golden Age of Piracy was fairly depicted in Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. It is my personal belief that despite the evident use of a predominantly fictional plot alongside a series of minor anachronisms and tweaks to recorded facts, Overall, the writers did provide players with a reasonably strong depiction of the period. For me, the game succeeded in illustrating this post-war period in which trained men who felt abandoned by their countries turned to a life of crime that offered them the possibility to attain a level of freedom and wealth they had never before imagined. Taking advantage of the weak regional governments and the limited military presence, they were soon shown as dominating the area. However, just as they reached their peak, the hammer came down. Their European targets had grown tired of their antics, stronger laws were put in place, former pirates turned to pirate hunting thus betraying their old friends, and a growing military involvement in the area quickly led to their decline. Overall, although it clearly isn't a completely historically accurate portrayal of the golden age of piracy, I still feel it touched on many of its most important components, which gave players a better, albeit still a bit romanticized look at this very unique stretch of history. And with that final thought, we have reached the end of this episode. If you enjoyed the content, please share this series with your friends, and be sure to explore our other videos. For the time being, I will continue covering the franchise's time periods, but please feel free to leave me your topic requests for future videos in the comments. As always, my sources used for making this video will be in the description bar below. Thank you for watching.